Departamento de Ciências da Comunicação, FCSH, UNL. Olá, pessoal. Nossa conferência está no fim. E é uma excelente prazer estar aqui. Desde que o cinema já está há 170 anos, a organização escolhe para este prazer um professor professor. And they've asked me to introduce her. When I first met Lucia some 15 years ago at a conference in Brazil, I was so impressed with her presentation that I started asking, who is she? Who is she? And the answer was, oh. Lucia Najib é um avião. Lucia Najib is an airplane, and I still think that's a very precise definition. Lucia Najib is centenary professor of World Cinema at the University of Leeds, where she is director of the Center for World Cinema. This center is interested in the singularities that exist all over the world and stimulates the creation of theories based in local productions. The center includes a mixed cinema network with institutions from Australia, Japan, Denmark and UK. I'm impressed with the quantity of males they send me all the time with exciting conferences and guests from all over the world. They're lucky in Leeds to have that. Professor Najib is extremely active, as we could see here during our conference, always attending different uh, panels and discussing them. Her first area was literature, and she worked as an editor in a magazine. There she, wrote, uh, she read a book about a uh, book from uh, by Werner Herzog got interested in him, saw his films, and decided to do a master's degree on Herzog and later a PhD on Oshima, both with the great Brazilian master Ismail Xavier, and both dissertations were published. She was a professor in Sao Paulo for about 10 years, then the airplane started taking off quite often to England because her second husband is British. She was visiting, visiting fellow in Oxford, then in 2003, Laura Mulvey invited her to spend one year as guest professor at Birbeck College. And during this period, a position opened in Leeds, celebrating the centenary of Leeds University. The competition was tough, but Lucia won. No wonder. Not many people have published so extensively. Seven sing single author books, plus eight books as editor or co-editor, on Brazilian cinema, Japanese nouvelle vague, Mizoguchi, Ozu, and theory of cinema, not to mention numerous articles. Her last books from last year are Theorizing World Cinema, where she was co-editor, and this one, World Cinema and the Ethics of Realism, a fantastic, mature and innovative book on which Dudley Andrew uh, writes, Lucien Argyle has a sharp eye for what, through her lens, becomes stupefying motives and moments within films that she just as sharply cuts out of the vast heritage movies. This book honors the importance, not just the beauty, of cinematic art. The book uh, includes films like the first Inuit films, Sahel, Glauber Rocha, Truffaut, the new Brazilian cinema, Paul Jean, Eroticized Nation, Hara, Kobayashi, the Portuguese filmmaker Jean César Monteiro. And uh, today she decided to pay homage to Portugal in her conference called Stasis, Scale and Urban Portugal. So, Fasten your seatbelts and please a warm and welcome to Lucian Aji. I'm terribly embarrassed with this introduction. You made such an archaeological excavation of my past there that I, I don't know where you found this information, but I suppose with the internet these days you can just dig out whatever secrets you have in your back. Uh, anyway, thank you so much, Paolo. Um, you are, you know, one of my inspirations when I write about Jean-Cesar Monteiro. And I'm so delighted to be here today. 
Um, I, I've been watching so many inspiring, thought-provoking, fascinating talks. There is so much going on in Portuguese cinema and in Portuguese scholarship. Um, and, um, and the fact that this audience is so generous is proved today by your presence here after three days of extremely intense programming and um, uh, parallel sessions throughout next. Uh, so I thank you all in the first place for being here tonight. And I have to thank the next team for uh, being so supportive and uh, Serge Branco, who was a fantastic, perfect, impeccable communicator throughout uh, the, the process of inviting me to be here today. Um, uh, um, and indeed, as Paulo said, this paper is a homage to Portugal um, and a homage to Cinefilia and also a homage to the magical mixture between the two. Um, I know that all Portuguese will know the first quote here, and um, the others are uh, perhaps more international, one of them coming from Galba Horsha. But I, what I wanted to highlight through these quotes, quotes is the question of scale and perspective that is going to be central to my paper as well as the question of time. So, uh, this talk will look at three films whose Portuguese urban settings offer a privileged insight into the workings of time and scale on screen, which in turn allow for the re-evaluation of the classical, modern, postmodern categorizations with regard to cinema. They are The State of Things, Vin Vendors, 1982, Foreign Land, uh, Walter Silas and Daniela Thomas, 95, and Mysteries of Lisbon uh, uh, by Raul Ruiz, 2010. <coughs> In them, the city is the place where vicious circles, mirrors, replicas, and mise en bring the vertiginous movement that had characterized the modernist city of the 1920s cinema to a halt. Curiously, too, it is the place where the so-called postmodern aesthetics finally find an ideal home in self-ironical tales that expose the film medium's narrative shortcomings. Intermediate devices, whether Polaroid stills or cardboard cutout theater, are then resorted to in order to turn a larger-than-life reality into framed, manageable narrative miniatures. The scaled-down reel, however, turns out to be a disappointing simulacrum, a memory ersatz that unveils the illusory character of cosmopolitan teleology. In my approach, I will start by re-examining the intertwined and transnational genesis of these films that resulted in three correlated but very different visions of the end of history and of storytelling, typical of postmodern aesthetics. I will move on to consider intermediate miniaturism as an attempt to stop time within movement an equation that inevitably brings to mind the Deleuzean movement time binary, which I will re revisit in an attempt to disentangle it from the classical modern opposition. I will conclude by proposing reflexive stasis and scale reversal as the common denominators across all modern projects, hence perhaps a more advantageous model than modernity to signify artistic and political values. So this is the thesis that runs through my paper today. <coughs> uh, it is normally understood as typical of postmodern cinema to resort to cinephilia as a means to compensate for creative stagnation. And indeed the Portuguese connection in focus here harks back to a period that saw a wave, a wave of revisionism in cinema worldwide. Portugal is famous for its highly original and uncompromising auteurist cinema. Most remarkably, it is a forerunner and faithful devotee to what is known in our day as slow cinema. Cinephilia has put down strong roots in its soil and generated a culture of quality over quantity 
that over the years has contributed to world cinema some of its giants, including the oldest filmmaker in history, Manuel de Oliveira, still active at 103 years of age, the self-performing uh, performing multi-talented auteur Jean-César Monteiro, and concierge's darling, Pedro Costa. Uh, this combination of creative freedom, cinephilia, and slow cinema tradition was certainly the main attraction for the four film directors in, uh, in focus here, Raul Ruiz, Wim Wenders, Walter Salles, and the Thomas. Thomas. Despite their stemming from disparate generations, locations, and cultural backgrounds, they all chose to try their hand in Portugal at turning points in their careers as a kind of safe haven for the recalibration of their creative momentum. The films they produced here can be seen as some sort of Portuguese interlude, as the directors attempted to take a distance from difficult situations at home or at their current workplaces and devote themselves to undisturbed experimentation. Uh, the resulting films were all to do with the anxiety or ironical realization of doom and death, the death of cinema in Vendors, the end of the European colonial empire in Greece, and the failure of post-colonial reconciliation in Silas and Thomas. It was Ruiz who in 1981, with The Territory, a non-pretentious low-budget film, inaugurated the trend of the Portuguese interview which then cascaded down in a chain reaction through his peers, fueled by transnational cinephilia, as you can see here. I will explain these connections uh, in more detail. Sadly deceased last year, Ruiz was a Chilean exile living in France since the mid-1970s, for whom Portugal was an escape within an escape, providing the ideal setting for his radically independent as well as prolific uh, cinematic production. Around the same period of the late 1970s, and signaling the beginning of a strongly recessive trend worldwide, Hollywood became awash with remakes and sequels that recycled both homemade and foreign classics. In Europe and elsewhere, the end of the revolutionary new wave prompted filmmakers to look back on film history in search of raw material, a front runner of this tendency being Wim Wenders, the Wunderkind of the German New Wave between the 1960s and mid-1970s. In 1978, uh, Francis Ford Coppola's, uh, on Francis uh, Ford Coppola's invitation, Wenders left a stagnant scene in his German home for America in order to engage with the nostalgic wave that both reassessed canonical Hollywood genres and reflected on his generation's creative downturn. The result was Hamlet, a new, uh, a new fated homage to film noir that prefigures the postmodern icon Tarantino by a decade, bar the latter's humor. Uh, Vendor's misadventure in Hollywood, stretching for over four years, however, was not entirely lost as he managed to produce two independent films in the meantime in an attempt to set the record straight about his relationship with Coppola and Hollywood. Reverse Angle, 1982, and the film in focus here, The State of Things. As the legend goes, in one of his trips between Europe and the US, where Hammett had stalled, Wendel stops over in Sintra in, the, uh, in order to help Ruiz with some footage left over so he could finish his underfunded The Territory. Impressed by the rushes and the relaxed atmosphere on the set of Ruiz's film, Wenders reportedly imposed as a condition for his donation that the whole cast and crew of the territory would stay on in Portugal to work in a film of his own, which he started to write on the spot. Thus began the state of things, which is, at origin, a kind of sequel to or meta-commentary on the territory. The title of the film, however, is one that was part of Wenders' repertoire since 1972, when he was planning to shoot a totally phenomenological film, something that was purely descriptive, and I'm quoting his words. As Schutte suggests, and um, I quote Schutte here, 
This had to do with a Vendesian obsession with the idea of stagnation and the false movement that appears in the title of one of his earlier films, Parashe de Vigne, The Wrong Move, 1975. In the state of things, stasis multiplies in mise en abîme, in retro black and white in the hands of Nouvelle Vague cinematographer Henri <coughs> Alcan. <clears throat> the film starts by rendering a remake of Roger Corman's The Day the World Ended, 1959, under the title of The Survivors, Corman being a co-producer of The Territory, who also makes a cameo appearance in The State of Things. It then switches the focus onto the cast and crew involved in the shoot of this remake, brought to a halt for lack of raw material, just as it had happened with The Territory in reality. The rest of the film revolves around the character's endless waiting for the American producer, an American producer named Gordon, in a tongue-in-cheek um, tongue allusion to Beckett's The Door, uh, to come to their rescue with cash. <coughs> um, actors and technicians kill time in solitary activities in their hotel in Sintra, a partial room half submerged in the sea. Uh, visiting a morose Lisbon from time to time for a change. Meanwhile, the director, Fritz Munro, so named in honor of both Fritz Lang and Friedrich Wilhelm Murnau, travels back to Hollywood in search of Gordon, where both finally meet their death. As for Foreign Land, it is a Brazilian Portuguese co production whose executive producer, Antonio da Cunha Teles, was also behind a number of Wiz's films. It was, however, vendors who offered the ideal way out for Silas and Thomas, faced with a nefarious newly elected government in their home country, Brazil, which had brought film production to a complete halt in the early 1990s. <clears throat> Walter Silas is a self-confessed admirer of vendors whose kinship with the German director can be easily observed in his interest in aimless travelers that litter his films from the beginning to his latter, latest adaptation of uh, Jack Kerouac's On the Road, uh, all reminiscent of the characters in Wim Wenders' uh, uh, early 1970s films, such as The Kings of the, Kings of the Road and Alice in the Cities. In Foreign Land, the option for black and white, though primarily due to economic concerns, is no less tributary to Venice's avowed preference for this talk in his early films. And of course, the state of things is a sibling of foreign land through its Portuguese settings. And it is not a coincidence that Venders was again exercising his independent filmmaking penchant in Portugal with Lisbon's story in 1994, at a time when Salis and Thomas um, and their team were over there or here working on foreign land. Foreign Land focuses on Brazilian migrants in Lisbon, trying to make um, ends meet through dubious jobs, including drugs and precious stones trafficking. There, they meet their African post-colonial counterparts, with whom they share the degrading situation of underemployment and illegal status, whilst Portugal itself is portrayed as a European outcast on the continent's periphery. The most conventionally narrative film of the three in focus here, um, it is nonetheless a result of the postmodern trend insofar as it is a collection of citations of other films and artworks, including uh, Wells, Houston, Herzog, Godard, and a plethora of literary sources, including Pessoa, Goethe, and Shakespeare. Moreover, it demonstrates Portugal's enduring attraction for filmmakers engaged with cinematic, cinematic innovation, which would continue unabated until 2010 with Raul Ruiz's last and best ever film, Mysteries of Wisdom. Providing a magnificent closure to a cinephiliac chain he himself had initiated two decades earlier, Mysteries of Wisdom is a monumental piece of filmmaking stretching for over four hours as a feature film and at least six hours in its original format as a TV series. Misa Rabin is the rule in this masterly adaptation carried out by Carlos Saboga 
of Camilo Castel Branco's romantic Portuguese novel in three volumes, in which interconnected stories multiply wide and deep across generations. In the typically inflatable serial style, entirely shot in Portugal and in Portuguese, the film is a tale of moral decadence involving a parasitical bourgeoisie living out of colonial plundering and uh, repentant libertines disguised as mysterious clergymen. With, it, with its intermediate virtuosity and polyphonic narrative style, Mysteries of Lisbon joins the other two films in providing the means to reconsider, identify the limitations of, and overcome the tripartite division of film history into classical, modern, and postmodern. Let us now focus on the characterization of urban Portugal through Lisbon and Sintra in the three films in question. In them, the city is a far cry from the combination of crowds, machinery, and unstoppable movement at the core of modernist urban films, as epitomized by Berlin Symphony of Great City, Man with a Movie Camera, or Metropolis. Instead, Lisbon and Sintra seem to have been chosen precisely for enabling the representation of the city through an iconography of stagnation, desertification, and ruin rather than industrial dynamism. The main setting of the state of things is a monumental deserted hotel half sunk into the sea in reality, um, the, at the time of the film, but in reality the uh, Hotel Arribas on the Sintra seashore. And I thank Paolo and Felipe for giving me the tip about what hotel that was. Um, Though now entirely restored, as you can see here in the time of the film and then the current state of the, the same hotel. Uh, though now entirely restored and brought back to its original glory, at the time of the shoot, its courtyard, including a magnificent 100 meter swimming pool, was half submerged in the Atlantic. After stumbling upon this extravagant semi ruin in Sintra, Venders is said to have immediately decided to shoot his next film there. Um, with its relatively new 1960s modernist architecture, the Hotel Arribas introduces a theme that cuts across the entire film. The oxymoronic nature of capitalist progress, including its entertainment and tourist industry, whose staleness is constitutive of the novelty it advertises. A fact alarmingly confirmed by the now archaic electronic gadgets, including a pioneering Apple computer displayed in the film as next generation technology. And you can see this computer here in these two stills. <clears throat> Combined with other solitary entertainments, they are all signifiers of historical stasis as they conjure time into static photographs, paintings, drawings, writings, and sound recordings, including an automated sound clock whose artificial voice announcing the hours reiterates the false movement at the core of the Vendersian style. More significantly, reproduction, uh, reproduction of the real through gadgets and different artistic media is a means for the characters to come to terms with an overwhelming, crushing reality which they fail to comprehend and to subject to their own ends. In a scene that is almost literally reproduced in foreign land, I'm going to be showing the two scenes, Fritz's partner, Kate, weeps as she looks at the monumental seascape and feels unable to reproduce its contours on paper. I'm going to show this clip now. Nothing. What do you mean by lights and darks? 
Well, nature, everything is just lights and darks. I mean, you see, the, the only way you could paint this is by putting the lights against the darks. Otherwise, it's nothing. Everything is lights and darks, shadows and light. You see, the surf is the light. And in between the surf, the breakers, is the dark. And that's what gives it form. among the Isle of Newcastle, at this couple you can see here, uh, frame the same view with their camera, which is then immediately reduced to a miniature and disappointing simulacrum. Manipulation of scale and proportion is a fundamental property of photography and cinema, with the close-up being the most radical distortion of the real enabled by these media. The effect of such distortions on the spectator is one that Marion Dawn directly connects with the growth of capitalism, as the subject is situated as, and I quote, epistemologically inadequate and incapable of ever actually mapping or understanding the totality of social forces that determine his or her position, end of quote. She says, and I quote again, although the miniature appears completely intelligible and knowable, the gigantic exceeds the viewer's grasp and inclinates the limited possibility of partial knowledge. End of quote. In the state of things, the struggle of self-reflexive characters faced with the impossibility of reproducing the real in its overwhelming totality is directly connected with the disposable nature of photography as an industrial product. Uh, this is hard to see without explaining what it is. Uh, the impossible scale of the real thus brings home to the characters, who are the cast and crew of a film within a film, their minute importance within a gigantic setting, wonderfully represented by the tiny bubble car parked at the portentous ruins of the hotel courtyard. With a, an effort of imagination, you can see that. Um, the, the static and descriptive framings used to produce such an effect constantly bring to the fore cinema's photographic stillness and reinforce the general anxiety of cinema's death through stasis on the thematic level, which is corroborated by numerous shots of cinemas in ruins on the streets of Sintra, Lisbon, and towards the end of the film, Los Angeles. You can see the um, sign of a cinema, PM, behind the character there, and this is another cine theatre. Um, on the lower picture there. Um, on a similarly metaphorical level, the city is recurrently linked to a sinking ship as the waves engulf the hotel more and more. On the character's point of view, at a, um, uh, sorry, one of the characters points at a plastic earth globe and comments, and I quote what he's saying, Lisbon is really right at the edge, the far western corner of Europe. Indeed, there's water right in front of my window. And the metaphor of a sinking ship is recurrently replayed in the character's lines. For example, when Fritz uh, reads aloud to himself from the book The Searchers about, and I quote, the terrible sense of an inevitable doom that overpowered him every time he encountered this ship. The idea of ruin and failure that brings historical progression to a standstill is also at the core of Foreign Land, a film even more strongly dominated by the motif of a shipwreck, replayed both visually and in the interdiagetic lyrics sung by the female protagonist, Alice. According to Salis, at the origin of the film are the photographs of a shipwreck on the Cape Verde coast that you can see here, taken by the French photographer Jean-Pierre Favreau. Salis took his crew and cast to Cape Verde to shoot the protagonist's couple against the backdrop of this shipwreck, 
which was then edited as located in Portugal, in combination with majestic imagery of sea in the surroundings of Sintra and the Tagus River in Lisbon. Rather, um, here, rather than architectural and technological capitalism, it is the colonial project which is fated to do with, within a disastrous tale of migration and diaspora whose causes hop back to the era of the great discoveries. This idea is again corroborated in the dialogue through which the shipwreck motif is connected to the end of the urban project. For example, in this line uttered by the shopkeeper Pedro about Lisbon, and I, I quote his line, this is not a place to find anybody. This is the land of the people who left for the sea. It's the ideal place to lose somebody or to get lost from oneself. End of quote. If in this film the whole idea of monumental doom is indebted to vendors, the other important cinephilic reference is cinema novo leader Glauber Rocha um, and the sea imagery in his film. Uh, both his films, Black World, White Devil of 64, and more importantly in France, uh, Terre Treze, 1967. The latter, a sweeping account of Brazilian historical failures against the backdrop of the discovery myth mythology. In foreign land, ungraspable monumentality and scale reversal play a key role in the confrontation between colonizer and colonized as in this famous scene in which the characters become aware of the minute dimensions of their gigantic territory of origin, Brazil, when seen from the colonizer's perspective. Uh, <clears throat> um, Pablo and Alex, the lead couple, I'm going to show you this clip in a moment, I'm just introducing it. Um, Pablo and Alex, the lead couple, find themselves in um, Cabo Especial, Cape Especial, the same location as in Van der Stone, in the, the scene we've just seen, sorry, uh, defined in the film as Europe's furthest westerly point, seated at the edge of a precipice beyond which lies the vast open sea. For a moment, the sea fills the frame and then the camera drifts back to capture Alex and Paco from behind, looking out to the sea before them and holding the following kind of self-deprecating dialogue. And this is the second clip of the edition. provincial 19th century characters, who cannot perceive beyond the narrow frame of windows and mirrors in their convent, convents, houses and carriages. This could obviously be read as the usual device employed both in studio films and TV serials, 
such as this film was at origin, in which the recurrent use of tight close-ups betrays the intention to avoid the construction of costly settings. As a possible adept of such a trick, Mysteries of Lisbon could be read as akin to the classical or commercial narrative style. However, as opposed to commercial cinema, uh, the film is not just, uh, uh, sorry, it's not just the spectator who is unable to see beyond the narrow film, but also the characters within the diegesis. Thus, the explicit way uh, this trick is employed so as to elicit the viewer's awareness of the artifice, making the city conspicuous for its absence, would rather suit the self-reflexivity normally attributed to modern cinema. Here I show one very uh, interesting scene in the film in which there is a duel, and all the characters can see, because they are kind of enclosed into a carriage, are hands shooting, a leg flying through, uh, and they cannot make sense of the whole scene. It, the, their view is completely restricted by the frame within the frame. In this case, it's the window of a carriage. <clears throat> On the other hand, the superposition of similar stories across generations, suggesting simultaneity rather than historical progression, casts doubt upon the modern teleology. Emphasizing the idea of stasis are the constant intermediate interferences that freeze historical episodes into paintings, Portuguese style motifs, and in particular, recurrent scenes played out in a cardboard cutout theater given to the protagonist, Pedro, by his mother, whom he first meets when he is 14 years old. The mysterious reasons why he was raised in a convent and kept away from his mother for so long is just one of the many mysteries Pedro is confronted with in a complicated plot that successively unfolds the various past identities of Father Denis, who took care of his education. In a scene that summarizes the film's conception as a whole, Pedro is first placed in the position of a film spectator who sees and hears through the window as Father Denise, accompanied by Don Antonio, urges Pedro's mother to forgive his tyrannical husband, currently uh, lying on his deathbed in Santarém. Pedro is radically opposed to this plan that he rightly fears will tell, tear him apart from his mother once again. The scene outside his window is then replaced by the miniature characters uh, in the cardboard cutout theater, representing his mother, Father Denise, and Don Antonio, whom Pedro flips down with mere finger flicks. I'm going to be showing this scene uh, and apologize in advance because the sound is a bit low in this scene. And um, um, Alvis, seu Alvis, chegou aquela hora que nós combinamos de aumentar o som. Eu 
se eu estou muito preocupante, é isso que me possa mudar de jogo. Desespero a ideia de um livro para o outro que é partir-se e eu vou passar o outro que te perdoa. Não, não. Não sei como vai. Eu vou sentar, meu filho. Queria que o nosso estava a vir a cenar. Irá com ele, não é verdade? Bem, meu filho. Quando? Amanhã, lá por ser. Ok, pode baixar o movimento, obrigada. Ok, so as well as reducing cinema to its reality of fiction and mechanical re reproduction, this self-reflexive scene also highlights the function of scale reversal as enabler of spectatorial participation as the spectator can just get rid of the characters within the scene. Scale dialectics in the cinema have been addressed, among others, by Deleuze, uh, who focused on the emphasis on large or small forms as typical of action montage cinema, examples ranging from Eisenstein for the large form to Chaplin for the small form. In the three exemplary scenes described above, however, Rather than action, scale reversal invariably elicits reflexive stasis, as a perplexed spectator within the diegesis brings the action to a halt. As such, scale reversal would chime much rather with Deleuze's idea of the time image and the cinema of the seer, whilst concomitantly bringing into question his classification of these devices as classical or modern. Now, the representation of the city through ruins, desertification and stagnation, which eschews the birth and perpetual movement inherent in the modernist urban experience, as seen in the state of things and foreign land, as much as the lack of visual motifs for it, as in the case of Mysteries of Lisbon, have been seen as characteristic of postmodern cinematic cities. Indeed, the films in focus here seem to follow to the letter the mix of nostalgia, citation, and self-defeating narrative structure that makes the standard postmodern recipe. As Dudley Andrew puts it, um, whereas before World War II, cinematic modernism was in league with Joyce, Dublin, and Dos Passos in rendering cities visible through symphonic form, Postmodern writers and filmmakers find the city invisible, discordant, and in a fundamental way, unrepresentable. Temporal simultaneity and spatial randomness work against this medium of time and space, for in cities today, simultaneity could mean being nowhere as, as well as everywhere at once, end of quote. When it comes to the association of the urban experience with doom, However, postmodern cities differ little from what is often described as the modern city. Starting with the centrality of war, catastrophe and ruins in the conceptualization of modernity itself. Suffice it to quote Benjamin's memorable definition of modernity in his aphorism on Paul Clay's Angelus Novus, an angel who looks in terror at the debris of the past whilst irresistibly compelled into the future by the storm of progress. This angel of history, it is worth recalling, makes a double bill appearance in a later Wim Wenders film, The Wings of Desire, uh, 1987, set in a fractured and war-scarred Berlin. The political importance of ruins within the modern cinematic project resides in the fact that by raising awareness of past catastrophes, they introduce self-reflexive stasis, which in turn makes room for participative spectatorship. Hell and Schoenle aptly summarize this phenomenon in the following terms. In its ambivalence and amorphousness, the ruin functions as a uniquely flexible and, uh, and productive trope for modernity self-awareness. Indeed, it is one of the master tropes of modern reflexivity, 
precisely because it encapsulates vacuity and loss as underlying constituents of the modern identity. It is the reflexivity of a culture that interrogates its own becoming. End of quote. Representing the apex of the cinephilic chain described above, Mysteries of Lisbon is a panegyric to the imagined ruins of Portugal, as literally expressed in the novel as, at its base in apocalyptic terms by the protagonist Padre Denis. And I'm going to read in English, that's here, but give the pleasure to the Portuguese to read it in Portuguese. Um, Everything will fall apart in Portugal. The day is not far off when life here will become, for many, boring and disgusting. Principles will be overturned. Civil war will not content itself with a small tribute of blood. There will be no losers or winners. Anarchy, after the war, will penetrate the government, whichever it is, and the foundations of a new edifice will be the corpses and ruins of many fortunes. Lucky those who will be able to watch from afar as the motherland fall into the vulture's claws. Here the English version. Um, as is well known, urban settings in ruins, as epitomized by neorealist films such as Germany Year Zero, were hailed by Bazin as the realist kernel of cinematic modernity. Deleuze himself dates modern cinema from the end of World War II in passages that seem to apply directly to the films in focus here, as they describe post-war urban spaces as any space whatever, made of demolished towns, shanty towns, vast unused places, docks, warehouses, heaps of girders, and scrap iron." End of quote. Most of these can be found in the catastrophe of sci-fi the survivors, the film within the film, in the state of things. The magnitude of the war for Deleuze caused the time image, typical of modernity, to interfere with and disrupt the action image he attributes to classical Hollywood and montage cinema in general, creating characters who are observers or seers rather than agents in a world that overwhelms their comprehension. Given the recurrence of war in human history, however, there is scope to investigate the combination of ruins and modernity before World War II. Indeed, Johannes von Moltke identifies ruins right at the birth of cinema. For example, in the Lumiere Brothers film, The Demolition of a Wall, which shows the destruction here, which shows <laughs> the destruction of a wall and its immediate reconstruction achieved through the simple trait of running the film backwards. This understanding coheres with the fact that, um, that cinema is not only related to, but a result of modernity. As Singer puts it, cinema emerged within the sensory environment of urban modernity related to late 19th century technologies of space and time and its interactions with adjacent elements in the new visual culture of advanced capitalism. End of quote. This undeniable fact, however, did not prevent Bazin from developing a concept of post-war modern cinema based on phenomenological realism that not only disregards cinema's modern nature, but disqualifies as modern the modernist avant-garde of the 1920s themselves, including Eisenstein, because of their reliance on montage. Deleuze then reinforced this model by rebranding it as time image as opposed to movement image. Many other appropriations of the modern, modern project came in the wake of these groundbreaking approaches as a means to defend certain cinemas against others, the usual fall being Hollywood. Beneficiaries have traditionally been the new waves of the 1960s and 70s, as well as new cinemas of all times, defined as modern or neo-modern, as opposed to a classical conservative norm. On the other hand, the pioneering theorist of the postmodern condition, Jean-François Lyotard, they expose modernity back to the birth of a reconstructed Europe, that is, and I quote, at least to the end of the 1950s, which for Europe marks the completion of reconstruction, end of quote. 
Such an understanding would certainly clash with most views of classical cinema, which see the 1950s as its climax. It would also contradict most approaches to the modern project described above, not least the Bazin de Vos periodization, which classifies under the modern banner a variety of productions stretching up to their own day. Both Bazin and Deleuze defended modernity on the basis of the novelty, hence progressive impetus, inherent in the ori original sense of the word modern, an idea that resonates with Habermas's more recent defense of the modern in terms of a revolt against the normalizing functions of tradition and a rebellion against all that is normative, and I'm quoting Habermas here. In his public debate with Lyotard, Habermas famously refused to accept the end of the modern project and its claim to progressive politics, dismissing Lyotard's description of the fall from grace in the postmodern era of scientific and rational knowledge. As far as cinema is concerned, however, Deleuze complicates the debate further by attributing progression to the movement image, that is, to classical rather than modern cinema, in the following terms. Time as progression derives from the movement image or from successive shots. But in modern cinema, in contrast, the time image is no longer empirical nor metaphysical. It is transcendental in the sense that Kant gives this word. Time is out of joint and presents itself in the pure state. And this understanding bears a striking resonance with the phenomena of temporal stasis and urban stagnation pointed out in the three films in question here, making them equally prone to characterizations as modern and postmodern and bringing into question the usefulness of such a criteria. As Rancière rightly points out, if there is a political question in contemporary art, it will not be grasped in terms of a modern postmodern opposition. It will be grasped through an analysis of the metamorphosis of the political third, the politics founded on the play of exchanges and displacements between the art world, world and that of non-art. This notwithstanding, Deleuze's definition of a time out of joint and in pure state is entirely applicable to the representation of urban Portugal in the films in focus here. Indeed, these films make use precisely of the country's location at the westernmost end of Europe, that is, at the periphery of Europe's self-attributed modernity, so as to configure it as a kind of space-time hiatus, or a time in pure state, that offers a distance viewpoint to worldly phenomena. Seen in this light, the modern or postmodern post categories become irrelevant, as they fail to provide reliable indicators of progressive politics. My view is that if such indicators exist, they are more likely to be found in the film's aesthetic features rather than in the historical moment of their production. Two such possible indicators I propose are reflexive stasis and scale reversal. Needless to say, if we are to discard, uh, sorry, if, you, if we are to discard the modern and postmodern categories as political and or artistical, artistic pointers, then the classical, as applied to cinema, must also be brought under suspicion. Indeed, the confusion around this label is no smaller than with its counterparts. Bordeaux, Steger and Thompson famously defined a classical style with regard to Hollywood films produced from its inception up to the 1960s. However, the Bazin de Luz identification of the classical with montage and action cinemas meant that virtually any films not in line with phenomenological realism for the former and the time image for the latter could, in principle, be considered classical in style. Fortunately, since Miriam Hansen's groundbreaking article, The Mass Production of the Senses, Classical Cinema as Vernacular Modernism, more convincing organizations of film history have started to emerge. 
Among other compelling arguments, Hansing highlights the self-reflexive potential of old Hollywood classics, for example, the excessive physicality of slapstick comedy, to explain how such films could have sparked vernacular modernisms elsewhere in the world. More recently, Laura Mulvey has formulated a similar argument, drawing on the self-reflexive potential of the real projection device, which, she says, smuggles something of modernism into the classic narrative. <clears throat> My own position is that the classical modern postmodern triptych obscures what is actually at stake in these debates, namely the latent expectation that an evolutionary line will confirm the teleology of history that privileges the new over the old. However, <coughs> But all these sophisticated approaches, including Balzan's realism, Deleuze's time image, Hansen's vernacular modernism, and new modern views of new waves and new cinemas revolve around, are moments or elements that represent or elicit a self-reflexive stoppage in time, allowing for spectatorial participation, as evidence, um, as evidence of a film's artistic and political credentials. My single and modest contribution to this debate is the idea of scale reversal as a natural complement to reflexive stasis, as it endows film with a rem uh, removed and self-critical point of view. Both these devices, I contend, are more reliable indicators of a film's value than historical teleology. As I hope to have demonstrated, urban Portugal in its cinematic, uh, cinematic portrayal um, as a time-space hiatus favoring distance, observation and reflexivity effectively dispenses with categories hinging on chronological markers and evolutionist periodizations. There are, however, a number of other conclusions to be drawn from this approach to which I intend to devote further elaboration. I will spare you from that. Thank you very much. Indeed.